Welcome to episode number 27 of the First Responder Wellness Podcast, and this is a special bonus edition of the show, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us. My name is Conrad Weaver, and I'm so excited to be able to bring our film to Maine for a couple of special events this week. And so that's why we have this special edition, because our guest is from Maine. So you'll learn about him in just a minute. But be sure to check out our website and social media pages to get all the information about all the events coming up. If you'd like to bring the film to your city and community, be sure to fill out the screening information form on our website at ptsd911movie.com. That's ptsd911movie, all one word, dot com. Jason Mills is the founder and CEO of The Resilient Responder, a training and consulting business for first responders. But Jason is also a retired fire lieutenant and flight medic up in Maine, and he's currently finishing up his master's degree in clinical mental health and counseling with a focus on first responders. So stay tuned for our compelling and very interesting conversation. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast. I know you're busy, and so I appreciate you taking time to listen. And I'm also grateful for everyone who's joining us on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is growing like crazy, and we're so excited about that. So if you haven't subscribed, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the little bell that will notify you every time we post something new on the podcast and on the YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe uh, on Apple Podcasts as well or wherever you listen to podcasts because this really helps us get the word out to more people about the show. And if you could do me a favor... I'd really appreciate it if you would take a minute to rate and review the show. This would mean the world to me, and it will help us get the word out to more people. Thanks again for listening and for watching, and now here's my conversation with Jason Mills. Well, Jason, welcome to the First Responder Wellness Podcast on this special edition here in March. We're coming to Maine, and so I thought, hey, let's let's get a Maine firefighter on the show. So, Jason, welcome. I appreciate uh, appreciate you having me onto the show, and I appreciate you coming into Maine and doing the work that you're doing for the first responder community. So glad to be here. Yeah. So for the audience, let us know. You know, what's your connection to as, as a first responder? What what did you do? What do you do? Yeah. So the the connection as a first responder goes back uh, a long time. My uh, my dad uh, my dad was the fire chief in in our community when I was growing up. Started as a volunteer in our town. Um, have a family that's uh, pretty much full of first responders. I have two brothers that are Maine State Troopers. Uh, my uh, my brother in law is uh, is a retired time chief from Augusta Fire Department. Uh, my best friend and I started through the uh, kind of the junior program, going through uh, going through high school, and then worked at the same department together. Uh, he's gone on. He works in Portland Fire. He's now the chief of our town. So kind of everybody that has been in my community or influential in my life growing up has been somehow involved in community service for, as a first responder. Mm-hmm. And so I started uh, the, the way I got here uh, to the point that I'm at now, the, I guess the shortest long story is um, went to started at a four-year college, realized that wasn't for me. Came back, uh, went to KVCC to get a paramedic certificate, started the Augusta Fire Department in 1997. And along the way, kind of wore a lot of different hats, as a lot of us do. Owned a couple of businesses along the way. Um, went uh, went to work for Life Flight of Maine for a while, for several years. Did that concurrently. And um, went, through my, went through my career. Um, and as a lot of us do, not everything went that well. And I tell people when I, when I speak or to anybody that will listen to, that will listen to me now that I didn't get to this position I'm in now because everything went well. Mm-hmm. I kind of took a little bit of a, you know, a bumpier path getting there. Mm-hmm. And so partway through my career towards the end of it, mostly I started being a little bit more, uh, aware of the mental health and, and mental resiliency of, of firefighters. And what I found for myself and for for the other uh, my my friends and colleagues that I would speak to is that when we were reaching out for for help with, with mental health issues, first of all, we were reaching out way way late in the game. Right? Mm-hmm. We weren't going in because we had some small problems to address. We were going in because either relationships or careers were falling apart in some pretty big way. But what we found was that we weren't necessarily getting access to people who we felt understood us. Mm -hmm. And so the experience wasn't fantastic. 
And when, so we came back from that less willing to engage in that process mm -hmm. going forward. And so as I got close to, to retiring, I had this idea that starts kicking around in my head that looks like, well, maybe you could be a counselor which I tried pretty hard to kick out of my head as soon as I could, because everything about my identity was, you know, I grew up, I was a football player, I was a wrestler, I owned a construction company, I was a firefighter, and I didn't do the mental health stuff. I didn't do that. And it wasn't part of my, my life. Uh, but this was something that wouldn't go away. And so eventually I start to let this in. I have a conversation about my wife with my wife about it. And she said, well, maybe you should look into it further. And I look into it further and I make this agreement with myself that I'll do this, but I'm going to do it under maybe my own terms ish. And if I'm going to do mental health, I'm going to do it as the way that I think will be helpful to first responders. So I enrolled in school, um, got a master's degree in clinical mental health, and just recently got licensed through the state of Maine. So here I am, uh, in, as a mental health, uh, uh, practitioner, mental health provider, um, and then on the, the side from that, I teach at SMCC, um, teaching health, wellness, and safety for the, uh, for the fire science program down there. And I own the Resilient Responder, which is the company that teaches uh, firefighter mental health and resiliency. And so I've had a lot of fun with that going out, reaching out to our, um, to our first responders and having a little bit of sharing what my experience was, but also a little bit of sharing what I've learned through the process of formal education and um, I'm having a good time with it and hopefully it's helping the people that are out there that need the help. Mm -hmm. What were some of those symptoms in your life while you were a firefighter? Some of those things that maybe kept cropping up in your life that made you kind of think twice about this mental health thing? Well, so, so I, like I mentioned, you know, I, like a lot of other firefighters, I ended up, I went through a divorce. Um, and you know, part of what was a real awakening for, for me after all of this fact was, a lot of the things that I didn't like that were happening in my life were things that I was doing to myself. Hmm. And some of those things were, were, were due some of it to the job, some of it to personality, but I was overloading myself. I was always taking on something more. I was always looking for a distraction. I was always looking for the next thing. And so I was never really present in the moment to be there, you know, through all the events that I wanted to, to be or should have wanted to be present for. And so my relationships started to break down. Um, and that kind of was maybe the real turning point was life's not working out the way that I thought it might work out. And, you know, my, my, my health was mm, back and forth. You know, sometimes I was, I was very compulsive. Sometimes I would be in fantastic shape and sometimes I would be not in so much shape. So physically I was in and out of a good spot. Emotionally I was in and out of a good spot. And I think that a lot of the, uh, there was certainly some impact from some really critical calls and, that stuff wasn't addressed um, at that time in a way that was beneficial. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was, um, and what I talk about through my resiliency stuff is that I was coming into work and in not a great place to be at work, mm -hmm. which meant that everything that happened at work had a bigger impact on me and just compounded all the other problems in all the other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you were part of the life flight, uh, you know, group there yeah. that, to me, as an outsider looking in and knowing what they do here in Maryland, the, the, the life flight kind of is responding to some of the worst places. Yeah, the acuity of the calls for life flight is it is typically the worst of the worst calls. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, they're the ones that are being called to transport from scenes, you know, mm -hmm. scene calls of, of motor vehicle accidents, of shootings, whatever it may be. Um, but also the ones that are taking the people from the highest uh, acuity from the community hospitals to the tertiary hospitals down to, to Portland and to Boston. And so almost every interaction that they have at a patient level is, is high stress. Sure. And it's, and that, you know, and that, then you add in all the other components of the air medical service, mm -hmm. the, the safety components of it that are just in eight to, you know, flying in a helicopter. Sure. Um, and the, the stress load becomes pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And did that also play a role in your, in your journey? The, the stress part of it, certainly. And what, what happened with my, my career in life flight, because there was a point that that's all I wanted to, to do. Like I wanted to be a flight medic. Did that become intoxicating just to be a part of that team? It did because we were operating at such a high level 
mm-hmm. um, that it really did make you feel like you were part of something elite. And I, st- I still believe that. Um, I, I still have friends that are part of Life Flight, and I still believe that they are, you know, functioning at a really high level, and they're providing some of the best uh, pre-hospital medicine a- available in the state. Um, what happened for me is during that period of time that I was working at Life Flight, I also owned two different businesses, mm-hmm. and I was still working at the fire department and I had young kids. Uh, so I'm going through all of this and really what kind of, what brought the, the, the life flight um, career or the life, my, my engagement with life flight to an end was it was the time of my life that I was going through a divorce mm-hmm. and I had to make a decision. Like, my kids are important to me and I need to be able to spend time with my children. And how am I supposed to be able to do that? If I work 48 hours at the fire station and I run these two other businesses and I'm getting onto this helicopter for, you know, 12, 24 hours a week per diem. Um, and what I felt was I couldn't keep up the level of education that I needed to have to be proficient and be good at my job. And I, it wasn't something I wanted to sacrifice. Um, but I also needed to be there to be available for my children as, you know, as, as they were growing up. And, and it's a time that you don't get to get back. Um, and the further you get away from that, the more acutely aware you become that that's a limited time. They're both uh, they're both grown and uh, one is uh, 22 and the other one will be 20 in the, in a couple of weeks. And they're both both doing very well. But those that period of time, you know, when they're playing youth sports and they're doing all the things in school, and um, you don't get it back. And I want to be there to be part of it. So that was that was what ultimately, you know, had me step away from uh, from that life flight career. Mm-hmm. Was, was that a difficult decision for you? Uh, in some ways, uh, in some ways it was, um, but I drew the line pretty quickly when I knew that it was going to be probably either that or the, or being able to be with my kids. Mm-hmm. However, it's one of the things that still is reoccurring to me, um, even in uh, reoccurring dreams mm-hmm. about getting into the helicopter and getting ready to go on a flight. Um, and part of that is that I was, I did feel really honored to be part of that group. It was, it was a fantastic group. I've never learned more in my life. Mm. Um, I used to kind of joke and say that I was the, the dumbest of a very, very smart group of people. <laughs> um, and I, I, I had, I really learned valuable lessons out of that. Uh, the, the amount of, that I learned just about medicine was immense. It, it was incredible. Um, but I also really learned some stuff about leadership from the, some of the people that were, were running that program at, at that time. Um, and a woman that I think is a, is, a, is a good friend of mine and just what it meant to be a strong leader. Um, and so I really appreciate what I took out of that experience and was able to apply going forward, even though I wasn't part of that group. And we have a group called the, uh, the life flight old timers group that was still gets together occasionally. And, uh, um, Kind of reminisce we, we and talk about yeah, yeah reminisce about the about the good old days yeah it was it was we had a lot of good times mm-hmm. together so and, and hopefully had a, a good impact on a lot of people's lives so you mentioned that your that your dad was a fire chief how much of uh, how much influence did that have or just maybe just the stories he would bring home that that influenced you not only in your career but also so, kind of that that trauma perhaps that he experienced that he brought to the table when you were, when you were young. Yeah. So this is, um, it it was a lot because I never knew a time that my dad wasn't the fire chief in our town Mm. and it's a small town. So it was, for me, it was important when we had uh, fire safety prevention week, it was my dad that came in and and gave the speeches Mm. and stuff. So that was an important thing for me. Uh, And I think it affected him, uh, you know, in ways, but in ways that, at that period of time, especially with him and, and with his background, that were difficult for him to ever acknowledge, mm-hmm. to ever express. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think about how that, how that has, how that affected me. I started very, very young in this mm-hmm. um, because my dad was the, the chief and, and a little bit of a renegade. Mm-hmm. I started in this line of work probably before you know maybe Bureau of Labor Standards and things would have liked to have, to have acknowledged, but I was in, you know, at the fire station and hanging around sure. um, at a pretty young age. I just told this story, ironically enough, uh, two days ago at a class that I was teaching. The first time I did CPR was when I was 13 years old. Wow. I was in eighth grade and it was on somebody that I knew. Mm-hmm. I knew who the person was and I left that call and went to my eighth grade dance. Wow. And that's the way it was. Wow. And, you know, I, re- I can recall being 
in high school and going to fatal car accidents. Mm. And I, it wasn't until I was well into my career into Augusta that we were doing any type of debriefings. And debriefings at that point were, the, they were kind of in their infancy, at least for our department, and they weren't necessarily run in the way that they're run today. Mm. And so what we found was that the outcome wasn't always fantastic. The people that the recipients of the intervention mm -hmm. sometimes left, oftentimes left, uh, not feeling any better and sometimes worse. I've heard stories of people saying that their debriefings were like, they'd get in the room like, everybody okay? You okay? You okay? Yeah, we're all good. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it, it was a lot of times the, the unwillingness or the inability for people to actually feel like that was a place that they could mm -hmm. say, that something's going on, yeah. that this is a little bit more. And even in the event, you know, immediately after the event, I think it's a hard, I think it's hard for us to gauge whether we actually are okay or not. Sure. We don't really know. I think we're doing a system recheck and trying to figure out, well, I don't know if I'm okay. I guess, you know, I guess I'm okay. Mm -hmm. But the effects of that get ingrained in us. And then I think come out when it starts um, when it starts complicating relationships, mm -hmm. other decision-making processes. And that's where we really get down this road of, wow, the stuff that's happening at work, even if I don't think it's tangible, even if I don't think that there's a, a, a real impact right now, actually is having a significant effect on me is how I operate. Because what happens is it changes our worldview. Mm -hmm. And when it changes our worldview, then it starts changing our relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can kind of pull that little, thread yeah. and see how it's all that stuff's connected, right? Yeah, there is really no, there are really none of no parts of our lives that are interconnected with the others. And when we start having damage inflicted in one area, it's hard to just say, well, that's just work. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I sometimes people will say, I leave work at work. I'm like, yeah, do you mm -hmm. though? Like, cause you probably don't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and maybe you think you do, but I bet if you, if we were to talk to your wife or your kids or, you know, hang out with your dog for a little bit, you know, one of those, <laughs> one of those uh, would tell us that maybe the things that happen at work aren't so compartmentalized to work as you might think they are. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I back a few yeah. years ago, I was working on another film and I was doing ride alongs with law enforcement and, and it was interesting how just being in a police car, sheriff's deputy's car for six hours on a, on a night shift can start changing your perspective. Yeah. You know, because we were always with the drug interdiction team and we'd be sitting on the interstate, you know, looking for cars with, with dope in them and they'd pull a car over and sure enough, there's dope. And they kind of taught me how to spot these cars. And, and I started doing that in my, on my own when I was driving down the highway. Oh, I bet that car's dirty. I bet that, that, that's, that, that's one that's got dope in it. And it changed my perspective, even the, even that short time. So I can't imagine if you're in this world and in your, that world you were in, 24 seven, how that changes your worldview. Yeah, it, it certainly does. You know, if you're a, if you're a florist, you probably think a lot about flowers. And if you're a banker, you probably think a lot about money. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're an educator, you probably think a lot about, you know, students in, in, in the curriculum. And if you're a first responder, you start thinking about the threats to your life mm -hmm. and, or, or the, or the damage that's being done to society through yeah. different things. And so it starts to reframe things when everybody else is just looking at the world, you're looking at the world and looking for the threats in it. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting thing that's a, you know, kind of a phenomenon that's, um, you know, goes across all of the, the first responder cultures is that if you go out to eat with a group of first responders, every single one of them wants to set someplace in the restaurant where they can see the door. Right. And I ask people when I do my, you know, when I, when I get a chance to teach and this comes up. I'll say, well, when you were six years old and you went to McDonald's with your parents, did you care where you sat? And inevitably, everybody says, no, I didn't care. So I said, well, something between the age that you were six years old going to McDonald's and the age that you are now, something happened in your life to tell your brain that you need to be looking at that entrance door all the time because you are concerned about your safety and you're worried about the, the threat. Mm -hmm. So there's been some type of cognitive switch. Um, but we also know that, that cognitive switch is actually hardwired into part of our survival system mm -hmm. and that we're rewiring parts of our brain. And, you know, in, in, a, in the same way that if you were to exercise a muscle, you know, it, that you would get stronger and the, and the, you know, the coordination would become better. When all we do is look for threats, the parts of our brain that receive threat information gets better and stronger and faster. And, you know, we set this cycle of 
being really good at looking for and finding mm-hmm. threats. So how do you unwire the rewired brain? Yeah, so that's the tough part. So all of the things that are going to happen to us because of our because of our job experience and the occupational hazards of being first responders, this stuff all happens completely naturally. Mm-hmm. Naturally, this is all part of your biological response to trying to make you survive to the next day. And so, how do you? That's the that's the question: is how do you start unwiring things that are happening actively? And part of it is, now I do this thing called a dot drill where we have people focus on different colored dots and we have them count them and, you know, we have them count the red dots. And what we find is that when we repeat this over and over and have them changed into different patterns, they become really good at finding these red dots, right? One, because the brain adapts to finding red dots pretty quickly. And two, once they know the number that's on the page, they just predict the outcome. And this is what's happening to our first responders. We're getting better at seeing threats, but then we're just predicting outcomes, whether they're actually going to happen or not. So the way we start undoing that is everything about that has to start being done intentionally. All the stuff that's done automatically now has to be intentionally undone. And some of that is stuff like mindfulness training, Um, you know, is look intentionally looking for the good that's out there because I still believe that I still believe there's a lot of good left Mm -hmm. in the world. We just skip over it. We just skip all the other colored dots, if you will, because we're so focused on one thing. It's kind of like when you buy a Ford Taurus, a red Ford Taurus, you see all the Ford Tauruses yes. out there, right? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and and this is what this is what happens. So we end up trying to be more mindful of, of our situation. The other thing that I've talked a lot about is this, you know, this physiological um the response to, to threat and to trauma is obviously kicking in our fight or flight system. And so part of that is this, we're, we're getting dumped with massive amounts of cortisol, not once in a while, but all the time. And so we're looking at ways that we, that we decrease our cortisol levels. And some of that, some of these things that decrease our cortisol levels are some of the things that are combating that automatic response to be hyper-focused on threats and to be um, hyper-vigilant. So when we when we think about the, the the trauma response, the trauma response is a very basic response. That fight or flight is a very basic response. When we talk about getting out of that and how do we correct for that, it becomes all of the things that are a higher level of functioning. And so if we can engage in activities, um, art, music, socialization, um, spirituality or religion, um, being active in our environments. Those are all things that one, we know will reduce cortisol levels, but also will reverse the effects of that, of that stress response and that chronic, that chronic threat that we're under. Hmm. You know, um, I had a question that floated through my mind and it floated right through right now. <laughs> <laughs> result of getting as old as I am. Um, so what was the, in, in your journey, when you maybe went off to school to get your advanced degree, what was that aha moment for you where it just kind of like, okay, wow, this makes sense now. And what did you do um, with that? I'm trying to think. So this is, I guess the aha moment um, is maybe still waiting to come, if you will. Um, the aha moment might be, um, one, I, I guess, let me think about this. Let me think about this, Conrad. I think that the aha is maybe that I'm blessed to be in this position, to be helping people mm-hmm. that are in a position I never thought that I would be in. I think if there's an aha moment outside of that, it is that there are a lot of people like me and a lot of people like my friends that need help. Um and here, here's the thing that I found about um, about mental mental health struggles, and I actually really enjoyed this uh, in the documentary, is that it didn't offer a single uh, a single issue treatment for it or a single answer. Um, in your video, I saw you know equine therapy looked like it was in there. Mm-hmm. There was some sports therapy in there. There was a resiliency piece in there. One of the gentlemen in, in the movie, Maddie, was very connected to his to his spiritual. Um, you know, to a spiritual connection at the end where he really found found religion. Mm-hmm. And that was the piece that worked for him. What I found going through this is that we have to be able to offer a lot of resources 
um, because what, what we need to do is connect with the end user. And the end user is the person that's the first responder that needs help. And what works for that person is the only thing that really matters. And it seemed that sometimes we were trying to do this, maybe one size fits all for everybody. Mm -hmm. All first responders are going are gonna to get this. And the, what I've learned and what's been really impactful for me is that everybody embraces this in some different way. And so what was what allowed me to get into this profession was saying, I'm going to do this the way that I want to do it. And it has to be from something that I feel is authentic to me. Um, and that's okay because some people will hear my message and receive it really well. But what I hope is that there are other people putting out a message that is different than mine that somebody else is going to hear. And so I think that is probably, if, you're, if the, the aha moment is, there is no one size fits all here for us. And what I want is a, to have a, a community of first responders and first responder clinicians that are all approaching this in a way that, you know, maybe you identify with the way that I, that I present this. But there might be other people that say, I, that doesn't really work for me. His doesn't work for me. But, you know, um, maybe, maybe Jody's way of doing it. I, I work with a, a fantastic woman named, named Jody, and uh, she's been a, a, a great mentor for me. But we have different styles. And so maybe Jody's message is the way that somebody else receives it better. And so what's important is to have the, the options out there. And I think that is what I'm trying to do and what makes me feel good about this. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll make this analogy to, uh, you know, if you're going to a personal trainer, right, there's probably a hundred different ways that you could possibly get in shape. And, you know, could you do it by swimming? Sure. Could you do it by, you know, this, that, or whatever. The, the one that works is the one that you'll do. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's the take home mm -hmm. on, on this is mental health is, what way am I going to do this or what way is this going to be presented that I say, yeah, that's for me. Like that message is the one that resonates for me. I can connect with that person and, and I can make this work because it's a partnership. Um, you know, the, the most predictive measure of whether therapy will work is not the type of therapy. It's not the level of education of the, the provider. It's whether there's a sense of connection mm. and that's kind of been researched and proven over and over. And so that's the important part is to get people out there that, uh, that our first responders identify with and feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. That's why I love doing this podcast because I bring so many different perspectives to the table mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, yours can be very different from the next person. And so and within right. those stories, someone's going to resonate, something's going to resonate with, with yes. a listener. So how do you convince uh, a firefighter, you know, John, who's been, squirting water on fires for 13, 20 years and doing all the things that firefighters and paramedics do. How do you convince John to uh, see a therapist or to get help or, or to convince him that maybe he should talk to someone about the stuff that's going on in his life? Yeah. You know, that's the difficult part is, is how do you, how do you, we know that the, we know that the work that we're doing is successful and we know that there's a benefit to it. However, there's also still a real wall and a real resistance to it. I think that the way around that uh, for the entire community is trust. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that there's any other way to do that. I think that you have to start developing trust. And that's trust on a personal level. Mm -hmm. That's trust that if you're a if you're a first responder and you come see me as as Jason, the, the clinician, that you can trust that everything that stays, that everything that happens in that relationship is one, confidential, but two, that I'm going to be looking out for your best interest. Right? I'm going to be doing as, as much as I can to try to help you as the person to try to find the right solution for you. Not the one that I think is best, not the one that would work for me, not the one that worked for the last five people I saw, but the one that's self-directed by you to get you the help that you need. I think that that would be, that's the initial part, but there also has to be trust on an administrative level, mm. like we have to, we have to start bringing this to the front so that anything that's happening from a mental health standpoint in the workplace is never punitive, mm. right? Mm -hmm. We need to have the, the freedom to be able to say things aren't going that great right now and have an, an have administrative policies in place that allow for that person to go out and seek the treatment they need. Um, and that comes from 
from within the department, that comes from leadership in the department, and that comes from beyond that from the people that are insuring the fire departments. Um, you know, are our, 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 our employees allowed, if they need, to step away from the job to get themselves healthy to come back? Um, I think a lot of times that doesn't happen. And so we run employees at a, at a, at a substandard performance for a very long time until something happens that breaks. Mm-hmm. Um, coming up in just a couple of weeks, there's a main fire chiefs conference. And uh, I'm going to do a presentation on that about uh, mental health from a fleet maintenance perspective. Mm-hmm. When we buy equipment in the fire department, we know how much we're going to spend on it to maintain it. Mm-hmm. And it's prioritized. And so every every week the truck is checked and every certain amount of miles, the oil is changed and the tires are rotated and all this. And because we know that in an emergency situation, we need that piece of equipment to function at its highest level. But that's not something that we do for our employees. Mm. You know, I can go to the department and say, how much are you going to, how much have you budgeted to maintain that tower truck? And they probably have a pretty good idea. They can also tell me who's going to do it. Mm-hmm. We're not just letting anybody step in. And and even to the extent that somebody says, well, we have a mechanic that can do it. Well, are you a mechanic that works on fire apparatus? Mm-hmm. And that's where we get to be with our clinical mental health is that not everybody is designed and not everybody has the cultural competence to be working with our first responders. Mm-hmm. And that's something that you don't want to be identifying when there's a when there's a crisis right. and putting that you know, into the budget is such a huge thing. I just, I don't know if you, there's a couple of episodes ago, I interviewed a fire captain out of, out of Texas and he helped his city do that. I, I saw that. I, I saw the beginning of that, uh, that podcast. Um, his name slips me right now, but um, it, it is a person that I would like to get into contact with yeah. um, because he, um, I, I saw that. And I thought that's the way that this needs to go. This right. is, this is the this should be the framework for all the departments. Yeah, I'm pulling up the uh, the episode here. It was uh, episode number 19, Jeremy Fuller. Jeremy yeah, Fuller, he's out yes, of Little Elm, Texas, and yeah, yeah, it was amazing. And he said, you know, as when you look at the budget of the the fire department or the budget of the city, it's just a tiny, tiny amount that yeah. they allocated yes. and 100% of their firefighters and their families were covered. Yeah. And what we know is that the money is well spent. It's not that this hasn't been studied in other places. The world health organization says that for every dollar that you spend on employee health and wellness, you save $4 on the other side wow. from, from sickness uh, you know, sickness, uh, lack of performance, absenteeism, all of these things. Um, you know, people that are uh, it, one of the big things, at least in our area now for fire departments is recruitment and retention. Mm-hmm. There are more job openings than we have qualified firefighters mm-hmm. for. And, and one of the big areas that you can look at in both, you know, what would, what would a mental health program help is, well, we can bring people in because employees, you know, prospective employees are looking for departments that value their employees, sure. their employees. And certainly nothing says that more than comprehensive health and wellness and resiliency programs that are part of the department um, uh, culture. Mm-hmm. And so that helps bring people in, but it also keeps them there. Mm-hmm. Sure. When you're talking about having a, a having a, a firefighter leave uh, for another department or just maybe just leave the, the profession altogether, you have to bring somebody else in now and that person has to be trained. And how much does that cost? So you, right. What's the cost of that? You know, some of the departments are running formal training programs. Um, I believe Portland Fire has an eight week formal training program. And so there's at least eight weeks of paying somebody that is not actually providing the service to the community and they're not training themselves. You've got to hire somebody to do the training. Uh, and then the, I'm sure there's other associated costs with it. So, And you're losing all that, th- those years of experience as well. You're bringing in someone yes. new, but they have no experience like the person who left. Well, yes, exactly. So the amount of money that it costs to turn over an employee for one that's left that would have otherwise stayed is huge. And, you know, then there's other things that, that fall into this, like, um, you know, workers' comp cases mm-hmm. where people leave because they because they're having struggles, and a lot of those. Um, I've talked to a lot of those people, uh, uh, tons of those people uh, I've spoken with. Um, you're probably familiar with the Center of Excellence. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's it's down. It's just here. an it's hour from my here. house here. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I was, I was lucky enough to go down there last spring. It's a fantastic facility, right? It's a, it's a huge resource for, for members of the fire service, but it is essentially a crisis intervention facility. And what would be good is if we weren't using that as our mental health program, Mm -hmm. because a lot of, a lot of departments, you have a couple of options. You have EAP, Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't necessarily connect you with a culturally competent uh, clinician for first responders or things unravel and you go to the center, but that's not without consequences for both the department and the employee. Um, and the, the members that I've talked to that have been down, they had really good experiences there and they're glad it was there, but they have almost all said, I wish I hadn't had to go. Mm. Um, glad it was there. But mm. if I had been able to avoid this by being more proactive and I've asked some of them, how far back do you think that you would have had to rewind your circumstances to be able to avoid going? Cause at, at some point, you know, you've tipped over the sure. edge and I think that's mm-hmm. probably inevitable. And some of them said, you know, if I could have gone back a year, mm-hmm. if I would have had a, a year of support and, and access to good quality mental health services, I probably could have avoided this. Wow. Um, so, you know, the, the proactive report, approach to this is, is really for money, uh, for the, from the, you know, the dollar standpoint is, is really the smart thing to do. How can, how can we convince the the bean counters to make that investment? You know, what, what does it take to get their attention to that? Hey, this is, this is a priority. It should be a priority. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's going to be my goal for this conference coming up in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to you to let you know how well I did with that. <laughs> but I think it, it works from, um, from a couple of different perspectives. One is budgets are tight. Mm-hmm. I don't think that we should pretend that everybody just has money to spend anywhere. Mm-hmm. So in, in training money is, is really tough to come by. So, because there are all the other things that you have to have, you know, you've got to put fuel in the truck, you've got to pay your employees, you have to, you know, all those things, you've got to have supplies. So the training budgets are sometimes the ones that are squeezed mm-hmm. down, but this money that could be spent here, if we can illustrate that it's, that it's saving money on the other side. I think that's where this starts mm-hmm. to this starts to change the conversation about not only is this a thing that you should do because it's the right thing for employees, but you should do this also because it's the right thing for the taxpayers that are funding the departments. Um, Portland Fire uh, a couple of years ago has hired a an in house clinician, so they have a full time clinician. Uh, great guy, guy named Oliver Burdine, uh, that set up some fantastic training for us. We just went to a, a, a week long training with him and, uh, that he brought in last week and, um, their, the evidence that they have on their mental health uh, reduction after bringing Oliver in full time is pretty, it's pretty convincing. Um, the amount of members that were going to the center of excellence has substantially decreased. Um, so that's, that's affecting their insurance rates and that is affecting, you know, time off from work, missed work, overtime that they're having to pay to backfill shifts for other people while they're gone. So there's some pretty convincing stuff there. Um, the other part that has to be part of this is that we can't just push back onto administration and say, well, if people would just throw more money at this, then this would be all solved. Mm -hmm. There has to be a point where we start taking responsibility as the employees of what am I doing in the other areas of my life? Um, and that's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when I realized that a lot of the things that were going badly in my life were, were my fault, it made it a little easier to correct because I knew where the source of the problem was. Um, and I think if we push back a little bit on employees and say, the job that we're doing, you know, we're not selling ice cream out here. Every day that you come to work, you're dealing with life and death and the life of other people or potentially the life, your own life. And say, what condition are you coming into work? And you know, when you come to work at seven o'clock in the morning, how ready are you to absorb the impacts that might be presented to you today? Mm-hmm. And so, when I do my resiliency-based stuff, my my definition of resiliency is the ability to uh, to absorb an impact. Mm-hmm. And one of the tools that I use to illustrate this, I, you know, I borrow from the law enforcement side, but I use a bulletproof vest. Mm-hmm. And putting on a bulletproof vest doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't, it doesn't say you're not going to get hit. That's, that's not what it does. There's no guarantee that if you have a vest on that you're not going to get shot. What it, and it doesn't tell you that you're not going to get hit. It doesn't tell you you're not going to get hurt. It doesn't tell you you're not going to get knocked down. 
doesn't tell you you're not going to need help from somebody else. The only thing that it does is it increases your ability to be able to get back on your feet and keep fighting. And we have resiliency tools available to us that we know in the same way will increase our personal resiliency to be able to absorb some of these impacts and move on. Um, You know, resiliency training, if you look at some of the studies, reduces, uh, you know, reduces uh, things like anxiety and depression by up to up to 40 percent. And then it, it, it increases quality of life factors by the same amount. So if we're looking at one of the things that's a, uh, you know, big issue in the fire service is, is suicide. Mm-hmm. Right? And so if we look at that and go, if you took somebody that was suicidal and made them 40% less anxious, 40% less depressed and increased their life by 40%, would they still be suicidal? And so you can make a pretty good argument that we'll probably not right. at that point. Right? Sure. And so, this all the, the resiliency training, the proactive training is addressing the suicide issue as well. Mm. Um, so I, I think that that's where we want to be focusing on is this has to be stuff has to be supported by administration. There has to be support for that, but there also has to be ownership from the members on how am I coming to work today? Because we know that somebody that in most areas of their life is functioning very well. When that person comes to work, they're not likely to just fall apart because they're in a work mm-hmm. environment. So if I come into work and, you know, I, I know who I am, which is part of that spiritual connection. I know what I stand for. My finances are in good shape. My relationships are in good shape. I'm healthy physically. Um, you know, I'm working to, to, in, to always to improve my, my intellectual ability. I'm working at my, at my, ocup- my occupational resiliency. So I'm trying to become a better employee. If we take that person and then we subject that person to a traumatic incident, their ability to navigate that is way higher than somebody that's coming through the door, you know, near bankruptcy with relationships that are falling apart, with a spiritual crisis, uh, who's, who's, who are physically unhealthy. You know, ultimately, we only have the ability to sustain so much impact mm-hmm. onto us. Um, and so the, the important part is that we know that the stuff at work is going to happen. We can't go through a career and just say, well, maybe we'll miss this, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's like, uh, you know, becoming a boxer and saying, maybe I'll just never get hit. That's probably not a reality, mm-hmm. uh, regardless of how good you are. Um, and so we need to be doing something ahead of time so that when that impact comes, we have the ability to sustain it. Mm-hmm. And I love, a, um, so I have a friend who's in law enforcement and, and his agency, they, they work swing shifts where he works days and nights and evenings. Yeah. And so, which is just horrible for sleep, sleep patterns. And so yeah. he and his buddies are doing some things to develop themselves personally, because they know that this, that the stress of the job and the, and this, this type of work environment is really hard on them. So they're doing some things like they're doing cold plunges, they're doing extra workouts, they're doing all these things to take care of themselves personally, even yeah. though the department isn't necessarily pushing them to that direction. So they're right. taking that personal responsibility, which is, I think is so important. If your department yeah. doesn't provide these things, you're still a human being. You're still responsible for yourself. Which I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a very important point that you're making there. Right. Right. Ultimately, uh, and, and to, you know, to, I, I love the cold plunges. It's a hard sell for most people, <laughs> but it's, uh, I've done the cold showers. Kind of I, I don't have a plunge tub, but uh, I've done the showers, which, which is yeah. kind of shocking t- anyway. So yes, yeah, so the, the, the evidence in the studies off of that stuff is fantastic. The amount that it raises testosterone, the amount that it raises dopamine, you know, it's all those things, the dopamine bump that you get out of it is, and it, and it actually decreases your cortisol mm-hmm. levels. And so you get this huge shift from high cortisol levels, low dopamine, low testosterone to low cortisol levels, high, high testosterone, high dopamine, which is that's the feel good that a lot of people are chasing through addictions Mm -hmm. is how do I get that, that little bit of a bump? Um, But yeah, I I love what your friends are doing because ultimately um, I talk about us being a commodity, right? We, we are a product Mm -hmm. and there's a value to our product depending on how well we take Mm -hmm. care of ourselves. And if we let everything from work spill over into personal life and, and vice versa, we have to think about the, the, the product that we're providing to the people that we care about. Mm-hmm. If we have you know, friends, uh, kids, spouses, when we come home from work, from that work environment, we're bringing something to them. And so then we have to think about, well, it, what's my value to, my, to the people that count mm-hmm. on me? And we want to be always improving that. We want to find ways that 
we are doing becoming a better person and working at becoming a better person all the time. And, you know, that's not always going to be a linear climb. You know, we have ups and downs, you know, life gets, life does what life does. Um, But I think that that's a good way of trying to frame this of, well, this isn't just about work. And, you know, if I'm doing these things to take care of myself, even if my employer isn't necessarily funding it or, or completely supporting it, well, am I going to just let myself fall apart because, because it's not supported there? Or am I going to take care of myself because I'm important enough to take care of? And if one person does it, it, it could be a ripple effect across the department, right? If, you know, if your buddy's doing the cold plunge and you're or doing these other things, you know, he's going to probably try it too, you know? And so it, it's going to be a ripple effect and pretty soon it, you'll have a healthier, healthier work environment because everybody's taking care of themselves. Right. And behaviors and mindsets become, become, um, contagious. Mm -hmm. If you have a, if you have a a core group of your department that that are doing things and then people start to see that the result of that is good, it's more likely that people jump onto that uh, bandwagon, if Mm -hmm. you will. And that starts to become culture, at least of that firehouse. And if you look at firehouses from town to town to town, you can see a lot of different culture. You know, there may be culture in, in one firehouse or even shift to shift, um, you know, that one of them is, you know, quite healthy mm-hmm. and positive and they're working to, you know, towards bettering themselves in, in different areas. And then you'll see that, you know, that that maybe the morale isn't good in another firehouse and that starts to be contagious mm-hmm. as well. And now we start the snowball effect of that keeps going and it keeps going. And, and now we have a negative culture within that firehouse or, or within that. Here's the challenge you have in a lot of firehouses, especially out here on the East coast is you have a lot of volunteers and you know, a lot of volunteer mm-hmm. entire firehouses are volunteer. And here in Emmitsburg, our local fire station is mostly volunteer. There's a couple of uh, Frederick County guys that run the ambulance, but, uh, but just about everybody else is volunteer. So that presents its challenges too. Right. Yeah. Well, this has been a really fascinating conversation. Kind of explain what Resilient Responder is, what it was that you guys do, and how can people get in touch with you guys? Yeah. So um, the Resilient Responder is a a company that I started. It's supported um, uh, largely by uh, my wife doing all the technical (laughs) stuff for me. Uh, But it's, it's essentially me going out and trying to get this message out about that we have actually the control, the ability to control and change the outcome of things. Uh, it, it is that we don't have to sit back and wait for things to happen to us. We don't have to be victims. We can be proactive. Um, we don't, the world doesn't need more victims. What the world needs is, is more heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to put ourselves in the position to be useful for ourselves, useful for our families, useful for our communities. And the way we do that is through building resiliency. And so I do as much uh, education as I can uh, in, in outreach. I, I work with different fire departments. I provide edu- uh, teaching, consulting, I speak at conferences. And the idea of what we're doing is we're trying to look at eight different areas of, of life. And we're trying to take each of those areas and pick them apart and say, if I could make small changes. One of the things that we look for is we're not looking for new year's resolution type changes, right? We're not looking for the, I'm going to run five miles every single day for the rest of the year, because we know that, you know, by and large, that just Mm -hmm. doesn't happen. What we look at is if we take these areas of our lives and we can make some small changes that we know are attainable and sustainable. And if we multiply those small changes out over the course of time, over the course of a year, how might, how might our life be different at that point? And how much more resilient will we be? If we can get our finances in order, does that free us up from maybe not having to work every single overtime shift that comes by? And so we're missing quality time with our family and where our sleep is just always disturbed and we're getting exposed to twice as much trauma from work as we should. Are we looking at our health from our nutritional standpoints? Are we looking at, are we getting some exercise? Are we concerned at all about the quality of our sleep? Um, we're looking at spiritual things. Do I know who I am as a person? This doesn't have to be about religion. It has to be about who am I? If I were to develop a personal mission statement, what does it say about me? Because that allows me to know how I'm going to react to these difficult situations through work that are going to be impressed upon me. Um, It basically, 
is trying to make the whole person a stronger whole person, um, taking accountability for ourselves and our own actions, and just working continuously uh, to to grow as a as as a person in all areas of our life. That's awesome. And what's what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you? So um, I, I put this out there because I'm not very famous yet. So my <laughs> cell phone number is uh, is two zero seven four five eight. 0882. And I still tell people, uh, you know, until that thing starts ringing off the hook all hours of the day or night to just to give me a call or text me. Um, you can find us on, on Facebook, the resilient responder, and you can find us on the web, the resilient, resilient responder.com. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure that I make a connection with you with Jason Fuller down in Texas and get you guys connected so you can be talking and kind of, you can learn from each other. So, well, thank you so yes. much for, for taking time to be on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Appreciate what you're doing. And I look forward to coming up to Maine and having some lobster. Connor, I, <laughs> yes. Yeah. We get lobster uh, 12 months out of the year up here. It's always available. Um, Connor, and I appreciate the invite to be on the podcast and I appreciate what you're doing for our first responders. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for spending time with me on the show today. And thanks to all of you who have taken time to listen and to watch. And especially if you've taken time to leave a review. And if you haven't done that yet, you still have time. So... Put a comment in the, the notes on YouTube or go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review there. Leave a rating. That really helps us a lot. And remember, you are not alone. And if you need someone to talk to and don't know where you can turn, you can dial 988 for help. Be sure to tune in next week for another interview with an amazing first responder. And until then, be well, take care of yourself and those around you, and go out and do something great in the world.